um, went back last night to this wonderful book written in the middle of the 19th century by a Jewish rabbi who was an extremely incredible multilingual biblical scholar, a Talmudic scholar, on um, the harmony between the church and the synagogue. In other words, <laughs> in other words, welcome to post-Messianic Judaism, everyone. I want to establish two points. One is that at the time of Jesus, yes, the Jewish scholars, the Jewish theologians knew that Son of God was a name for the Messiah. The Messiah would be known by the name of Son of God. And the other, that the Messiah existed before creation existed, predated existence, uh, had something very fundamental to do with uncreated light, in fact, was the uncreated light, and that he fully participated in the divinity of uh, Jehovah, that is, the Tetragamon, yod heh vav -Hey, the unpronounceable name of God, which either was the name of the Messiah in his divinity or included the Messiah in his divinity. So that's pretty exciting stuff because all of that stuff is denied by modernists and by Jews today. But it was very clear from the rabbinic writings of the time. Um, a lot of Judaism has been redefined in order to erase its connection with Christianity. Two, two main points. At the time of Jesus, first century BC, first century after Christ, AD, Judaism, and even actually, even today in principle, Judaism teaches that the Son of God is a name for the Messiah. That's number one. So whenever anybody said, called Jesus the Son of God, or said, could he be the Son of God, so forth, they were saying, could he be the Messiah? But note that that's already saying that the Messiah is not a normal human being. He's, he's not a normal human being. And then Jewish theology also taught that the Messiah, in a mystical sense, the Messiah was the true light of the world, seriously. That, was, that existed be, before creation and that illumined creation itself. That's pretty interesting from a Christian perspective since, you know, St. John calls, says he's the light of the world. And perhaps most importantly, that the Messiah was either God himself. Well, let me say Jehovah. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to use the word Jehovah for the Tetragamon, for the yud Hey vav Hey, the Y-H-V-H, -H, the unpronounceable holy name of God that uh, is not supposed to be pronounced. Uh, and I'll use the circumlocution Jehovah for that, that Y-H-V-H -H, tetragamon, which is where the consonants from Jehovah come from, by the way, with the wrong vowel sounds. So you're not saying the name you're not supposed to say. So anyway, Judaism taught that either the Messiah would be Jehovah himself or would be a part of Jehovah, would be... And, uh, yeah, a part of Jehovah, actually. Same substance as Jehovah. So here's the proof. First of all, about the fact that the Jews at the time of Christ knew that the Messiah would be the Son of God. Now remember that the New Testament uh, wasn't really written by Christians. It was written by Jews, people who were Jews, right? So it's not like they had any wrong idea about what Judaism taught about the Messiah. And the New Testament is full of um, the use of the term Son of God in, in times and places which make it clear that it was a name for the Messiah. For instance, at his trial, this is Matthew 26, at his trial, the high priest said to Jesus, I adjure you by the living God, Tell us if you are Christ, 
the Son of God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Don't you think the high priest knew Jewish theology? Not well enough to keep from crucifying Jesus, but that's another story. So the high priest knew that the Messiah's name would also be the Son of God. Tell us if you are Christ, if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. But he was silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? That's from Mark 14. Um, and then the crowds in Luke 22 all said to Jesus, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. So they're saying, Are you then the Messiah? And, uh, and then in Matthew 27, after the crucifixion, when the tombs were opened and the dead came to life, um, the centurion and those who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, and they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God, in other words, the Messiah. Anyway, I could go on and on and on. Uh, Acts 9, Matthew 14, John 1. In all those cases, the term Son of God is clearly used to refer to the Messiah by Jews in writings which were intended for other Jews. Okay, so there's no question that, that Jesus, that the Messiah was to be the Son of God. Now, why am I saying this? Because one, there, there are a number of um, anti-faith, anti-true faith, uh, myths running around, disinformation running around. And one is that the Jews at the time of Jesus were not expecting a divinity. They were not expecting a supernatural person. They were expecting a secular leader who would overthrow the Romans and restore the kingdom of Israel in a political sense. Um, and they were disappointed and they, they turned their back on him because they were expecting a political leader. Um, now, the uh, modernist Christians say that because they want to strip Jesus of his divinity. And the Jews say that because they want to build a impenetrable iron curtain between Christianity and Judaism and between the New Testament and the Old Testament. They redefine Jewish teaching to make it as contradictory to Christian teaching as possible. It would be very hard to find a Jewish rabbi today who acknowledges historic Jewish rabbis of the time of Jesus all the way up through actually the middle of the Middle Ages understood perfectly well that according to the Old Testament, according to the Torah, according to God's revelation, the Messiah would be Jehovah or part of Jehovah or would certainly participate in Jehovah's divinity. And this is in Jewish writings. So now I'm going to switch gears from Christian writings, i.e. the New Testament, to Jewish writings, i.e. the Talmud and uh, the Midrashim and some medieval uh, commentaries on the Talmud and the Targunim. And so anyway, so I'm, I'm now I'm going into the Jewish world and going to Jewish writings uh, from the time of Jesus that make clear that the Jewish understanding of the Old Testament was that the Messiah who is coming was going to be either Jehovah. Now remember, Jehovah, whenever you look in a Old Testament and you see the word Lord all in caps, the underlying Hebrew word is Jehovah. So whenever you see that word Lord all in caps, if you want to, you have Judaism's blessing to replace that word Lord with Jesus. It's very nice to do, by the way. The Lord said to my Lord, you change it to Jesus said to my Lord. Or, um, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, you change it to Jesus is my shepherd. You're not cheating. You're not Christianizing something that didn't have that in the first place, okay? Okay, because it was going to be the Messiah. If it's Lord in caps, it meant the Messiah, who was Jesus. Okay, so Midrashim. Okay, they are, they are commentaries. They're passages in the Talmud that are authoritative interpretations of the Torah. 
I'm approximating everything, but that's close enough. So here are some midrashim from the Talmud that uh, that are explaining Old Testament now Old Testament verses, and in a way that shows that the Messiah to come is going to be divine. Okay. Okay. So here's a midrash on that midrashim is plural of midrash on Psalm 21 verse 2. Um, first of all, the line in the psalm is, In thy strength the king rejoices, O Jehovah. And um, the Midrash says, God grants the king Messiah the glory of heaven, for it is written, In thy strength the king rejoices, O Jehovah. So, in the strength of Jehovah, the Messiah rejoices. The Midrash says that because of that verse, it means that God grants the King Messiah the glory of heaven. So there's a divinity in the Messiah. On Isaiah 52, verse 13 says, Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and raised high and shall be sublime. And the Midrash explains this by saying, My servant is the Messiah. He shall be um, exalted and raised high means that he will be high above Abraham and he shall be sublime means he will be above the angels. Human beings are not above the angels. Now, on Leviticus 25, verse 25, there's a midrash. First of all, let me read Leviticus 25, verse 25. If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. That sounds like just a little legal procedure, right? Like, like civil law. If your brother becomes poor and has to sell part of his property, then his redeemer, the one who pays his ransom, the one who gets him out of hock, shall come and redeem what his brother has sold you know, we'll go to the pawnbroker and buy back what the brother has sold. Now, the word for redeemer there is goel. Goel is the word for redeemer when the redeemer means the savior, the one who redeems mankind, the one who justifies mankind, that one that makes mankind capable of entering heaven. The Messiah is the redeemer. That's the same word, goel. So then the Talmud says, what is the real meaning of this verse? Because that's what the Talmud does a lot, is it takes a verse in the Torah that sounds pedestrian, like this story of a pawnbroker, right? And it tells, it, it, it uh, illumines, expounds on the very deep theological meaning. So this is in the Talmud book known as Sanhedrin. I, this is a quote, I'm reading it. And who is the Goel? Who is the Redeemer? It is I who is his Redeemer, responds Holy God, blessed is he. For it is written, their Redeemer is powerful. Jehovah, the Lord God of hosts, Jehovah of hosts is his name. For Holy God, blessed be he, will reign himself over Israel. And he alone will be their Redeemer. Okay? It's pretty direct. Jehovah, the Tetragammon, the Lord in caps, himself will come and will be the Messiah, will be the Redeemer. Okay? So you have a pretty direct statement in the Talmud that the Lord in caps in the Old Testament, Jehovah, the unpronounceable name of God, is actually Jesus, or at least Jesus is part of him. Because the Jehovah himself will be the Messiah. Now this is now I'm gonna get I'm gonna I'm gonna mention this other midrash. But um, it's a little bit it's a little bit more mysterious. Okay. The, the, the rabbis in the Talmud called the Messiah light, called Messiah, the, basically the true light, 
the uncreated light, the light that illumined creation itself, the light that was present at the time of creation, the light that preceded creation. Now, it taught that, the Talmud taught that from Genesis 1. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go through the, the subtlety, but it has to do with, with grammatical forms and so forth. And the, the, it's, it's pretty mystical interpretation. And it's also pretty, you know, dependent precisely on, on the particular verb forms used and so forth. But it, it, it's, there's no question. I, right now, we're not actually even talking about whether the Talmudic rabbis were right. We're just talking about what they taught. And the, the Talmud taught that the Messiah was the light that preceded creation. Okay, so they pretty much had that on target. And of course, the Jews, the well-educated, theologically sophisticated Jews of the time of Jesus, certainly knew this. And when St. John opens his gospel with, um, you know, the light came into the world. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to be bear witness to the light. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and yet the world knew him not. Now we think of that as a very Christian verse. But actually... Um, it would have made, you know, would have made the Talmudic rabbis spin with joy because it's, I don't want to say it's straight from the Talmud. It's not that it's straight from the Talmud. It's the revealed truth of God, which was revealed in the Talmud as well as revealed in to, to St. John. And it's uh, very worthwhile thinking about whether St. John uh, was familiar with the Jewish teaching about that. Um, and and it's, I, I can't really go into it, uh, in part because I don't fully understand it, and in part because it has to do with the particular Hebrew words. But the, um, when God saw that it was good, you know, everything that God created, he saw that it was good. Um, the Talmud goes into this great mystical depth, depth excuse me, about um, the goodness of creation and the seeing the goodness of creation uh, was all intertwined with the Messiah being the light that uh, illumined the goodness of creation. That's as good as I can do. But it was very, you can read, you can, when you read that first passage in, in John 1, in the light of this, uh, well, having just read, this um, explanation of the Talmudic um, exposition of the Messiah being the light that preceded creation and was intimately interwoven with the goodness of creation. It really jumps out at you. Okay. There is a parable proposed in it's actually in in it's a midrash it's in the midrash to halim and it's a parable on psalm 20 36 and i will read you this parable and it'll sound very familiar to you i hope i but it's in french so i'm going to have to translate it on the fly rabbi yohanan proposes this parable one man lit a light during the night um but it went out um, and then he lit it again, but it went out again. Finally, he said, how long am I going to exhaust myself uselessly this way? Why don't we wait until the sun has risen and we can walk in the light of day, in the brightness of day? Um, this was the case with the children of Israel. 
when they were slaves in Egypt, Moses and Aaron were raised up and saved them from their enslavement in Egypt. Then they were enslaved in Babylon and they were delivered by Ananias, Mishael, and Azarias. Um, and then they were subjugated by the Greeks and they were freed from their power by the courage and valor of the uh, Maccabees. Then they were submitted under the Romans. And then they said, when they were submitted under the Romans, just look, now we keep being um, redeemed and then uh, fall back into slavery and redeemed again and fall back into slavery. We no longer want a man to light our way on the earth, but we want God himself to illuminate us. As it is written, and now this is the verse from Psalm uh, 118, let God, Jehovah, illumine us. So basically, this Midrash is using this parable of a man who, you know, gets up in the middle of the night and wants to see, and he lights a light and goes out and lights a light and goes out and lights a light and goes out and says, I don't want to exhaust myself endlessly for no purpose. I'll wait till day. And so the Jews, uh, that was a parable that applied to the Jews because they were slaves in Egypt. They got a savior, but they fell back in slavery uh, to the um, Babylonians. They got, a, they got a savior, a deliverer. They fell back into subjugation to the Greeks. They got a savior. They got a deliverer. Then they fell back in subjugation to the Romans. And they said, enough of this. We're tired of being you know, enslaved and freed and enslaved and freed. We don't want another human redeemer. We want to wait for the light, the power of God to redeem us and be finally truly delivered and not fall back into slavery. And that, of course, was the Messiah. Um, and this Midrash is based on the uh, verse in line, uh, the line in Psalm 118, um, let God, Jehovah, be our light. Now, remember everything I read predates Jesus. It's, it's from the rabbis before the, um, before Jesus came. And this is exactly the time, precisely the time that Jews were under the Romans, that Jesus Christ, the word of God, the eternal light came to enlighten the world. The reason I'm saying this is again, because modernists, both Jews and Christians say, the Jews were looking forward to a Messiah to deliver them from the power of the Romans. That's not untrue, but they also wanted a Messiah to deliver them from the power of the Romans who would be divine, who would be God himself. So it wouldn't be just another cycle of enslavement, but it would be the final liberation. So the fact that they were looking forward to a Messiah to deliver them from the power of the Romans doesn't mean they were looking for a human political figure. It means they were looking for the true Messiah, who is God himself or an emanation of God or a part of God, so that it would be the ultimate redemption. Do you see what I mean? So it's not, it's not a contradiction that they were looking to be freed from the Romans and that they were looking for God himself to save them. Now, I'll just go through a couple of more um, passages from uh, the Talmud and from one of the Targumim that repeat the same thought or the same teaching that the Messiah was going to be Jehovah God. Okay, so here goes. A Midrash on Jeremiah 23. Verse six, first of all, the verse is, in his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called Jehovah, our righteousness. And the commentary says, Israel called the Messiah our righteousness because from the moment the Messiah comes, from the beginning of the days of the Messiah, the justification of Jehovah will remain with us 
the righteousness from Jehovah, our justification, the salvation of Jehovah, will remain with us and will no longer leave us. Okay? Which is exactly, exactly what happened when Jesus came, right? Our sins were redeemed. We were redeemed from our sins once and for all. Redemption for our sins was bought, was purchased once and for all. And and this uh, Rabbi uh, Imhi, who was who was like like this like number one Talmudic scholar Rabbi of the Middle Ages, said the reason why in Jeremiah Israel called the Messiah our righteousness was because he would basically purchase our righteousness for once and for all. Which means, of course, that he would have to be divine. Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 16. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring forth for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, Jehovah is our righteousness. Jehovah, again, Jehovah, yud heh vav -Hey, the Tetragammon, will be our righteousness. Righteousness slash justification. Same underlying uh, concept. Uh, now the Targum, the tar it's a long story, but the Targum are a th semi-canonical interpretations of uh, Old Testament, from certainly from the first few centuries. The Targumim are translations, they're like the Amplified Bible. You know that Protestant Amplified Bible? A kind of inter intertwines interpretation with the translation. Well, that's what the Targonim are. Uh, they're basically uh, translations that that incorporate some interpretation. So the Targum for that verse is, In these days, in these times, I will raise from David the Messiah of justification, or the Messiah of salvation. So all of these things are... Um, evidence that the Jews were not thinking the Messiah was anything other than what he really was. Ooh.